It started when USA uh, started exploring land and trade was happening across borders. Okay. And all of that was an uncharted, unceremonious and unaccounted sort of foreign investment. Now, of course, foreign investment through time has evolved. Okay. The major evolution of foreign investment that we've seen has happened from the time of the early 1900s uh, to, till 2009 and so on and so forth we've seen. But the development of investment law per se or foreign investment law per se after 2009 has, in my opinion, stagnated itself a bit. Okay. Now, notably the first after the formation of a world order of international law, the first, uh, the first uh, idea behind uh, uh, the first idea behind uh, the first documented investment treaty was entered into between Germany and Pakistan. Now, normally there's a trend in investment. You will see that the investment happens from where the investee is from a developed country and the investor is from a developing country in sorry the investor is from a developing country developed country and the investee is from a uh, developing country so your pakistan being the developing country being the investee and the investor being germany in this circumstance however before this history takes us back to the 18th century where we can see that france had entered into several of these treaties so-called FCN treaties, Friends, Commerce and Network treaties between uh, various countries uh, ranging from 1739 to various other uh, various, you know, throughout across the timeline. So we get some rough idea that, about the fact that there is some understanding, there is some genesis, there is some idea that, you know, uh, countries are propagating or trying to ideate on the thought that, that foreign investment is important. Foreign investment is crucial and that is the step forward in terms of how we propagate foreign trade, commerce, etc. Now, foreign investment or foreign investment treaty is a treaty in modern investment law is a document that is entered into between two countries. It might not be two countries, but what we are talking about here is a bilateral investment treaty. Bilateral investment treaty, as the name suggests, is between two countries. Okay. You have multilateral investment treaties, you have uh, continental investment treaties and so on and so forth. But here we're trying to restrict ourselves to bilateral investment uh, treaties. One second. Just give me a second, guys. Okay, so moving on. Uh, uh, so when we, when we talk about bilateral investment treaties, what we understand is that, like I said, there's a developing country, there's a developing country, but there's not, that's, not, that's not a stipulated law, that is a trend. That is a trend that there, there will be a developing country and there'll be a developed country who will be investing in the developing country. Okay, and the investment goal, it goes into the amount of let's say billions of dollars and it, it's not one investment right it's a framework which governs the investment between these two countries for example an investment treaty entered into, into between two countries uh, will govern the subsequent in investments coming in from that country to another country now why do people so so i being the developing country or i being the investor state will only be investing in another country primarily if I get something out of it, okay, investment, uh, bilateral investment, also like private equity or, or, or any other investment is also a commercial decision. Okay. Now that commercial de decision emanates from a very basic concept that I will be investing in your country for a betterment. For example, uh, um, uh, UK has invested in India's um, medical and healthcare sector in, in a great deal. Now, you, UK will be investing in, in such a project based on the BIT between India and UK. Keeping in mind that the government of India in the investment treaty 
will be affording the UK investment a certain amount of protection. Okay. Now there are various protections uh, that a country mutually gives each other in a framework of an investment treaty. That treaty is basically governs, contains the rights, liabilities and everything that the both of the countries will govern itself via the uh, their investment rounds by. So when UK is investing in India or India or somebody from India is investing back in the UK, they will govern the investment via the investment treaty. Now this investment treaty has mutually beneficial clauses. Now these mutually beneficial clauses are mutual protection clauses or investment protection clauses as we say. That means the very fact that I'm investing in your country, I am liable to certain amounts of protection. Now, what are these protections? Uh, can somebody list them out for me? And today, one of the protections, I mean, of course, one of the protections that we'll be, we'll be concentrating on today is fair and equitable treatment. But can somebody just for just, 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 just and, uh, and, uh, what are the other protections available? Yeah, yeah, I've, it's in the, I've mentioned the other I think we are having an issue connecting people. Everyone can unmute themselves uh, if they want to. But I think we've got the answers coming in in the comments. Okay, great. Okay, so yeah, so most favored nation is of course uh, one. Most favored nation is something that is very important. Uh, something else? Expropriation, of course, expropriation, fantastic. National treatment. Full protection. I'm sorry. Market access is a part of one of these protections, but as a whole, in my opinion, most favored nation, fair and equitable treatment, national treatment and expropriation, in my opinion, these are the main uh, defenses or protections that an investor gets in an investment treaty arbitration. Okay. Now, Let us, so the next part of the session, okay, is basically trying to delve into the fact and understand from a very righteous point of view that in the present circumstances of COVID-19, I'm just trying to make this a bit more interesting, primarily due to the fact to understand the factual analysis of how and what are we going to do in this current scenario of COVID-19 and fair and equitable treatment? Okay. Now, fair and equitable treatment is English. Is English that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. It says that I will be investing in your country or my investors from my country will continue to invest in your country. And reciprocally, if your investors invest in my country in a bilateral investment treaty, you will be accorded certain protections. And those protections are nationalization, like we discussed, national treatment, uh, most favored nation. But the standard of fair and equitable treatment is what we are going to discuss today. So fair and equitable treatment is basically nothing, but it goes on to say that if I invest in your country and there's a reciprocity of investment between these countries, what is going to happen is that the treatment that I meet, that I give my homegrown investors or a basic standard of investment is already being created for another country. The investment standard or investment expectation or investment protection should match that standard. Does anybody want me to repeat this? Because this is the fundamental basis on which I will continue. And then, of course, I'll be getting into analysis of China vis-a-vis -vis the present circumstances. Yes, sir. Please repeat. Fantastic, Prachi. Shreya, everybody. Okay, guys, got it, got it. Repeating it again. Okay. Uh, 
UK, let's say UK and India BIT. Okay. Now under the UK India BIT, India Indian investors are allowed to invest in UK and the UK investors are allowed to invest in India. Clear? Basics? Now, the fact that I'm investing in your country, being an Indian investor, the fact that I'm looking to invest in your country, I need some protection for my investment, right? I can't be giving a orphan investment like we call it. It can't be an orphan investment without any rights, without any liabilities. And why I pointed out initially that investments are mostly from a developed country to a developing country, mostly not a trend, but mostly is because the developing countries need the investment for their internal growth, for, for, for growth of certain industries. Now, India opened its borders for investment and liberalized itself in the early 1900s, 1990s, sorry. Once that happened, India also got into a trend of bilateral uh, entering into investment treaties. So let us take a specific treaty of India and UK. So what I'm trying to say is that these treaties will have protections. One of the protections for what we are discussing today is fair and equitable treatment. Fair and equitable treatment envisages the fact that if I am an investor under the UK India BIT, let's say I am from UK, I'm an investor, I'm a fund or whatever, I am investing in your country, in India. I will be treated fairly and equally. I might, I can understand that fair and equal might sound very vague to you because what is fair and what is, what is equal? That is what we are going to discuss. But on analysis as per English, fair and equal means that fair is that it should be fair as per international standards of investment and equal will be that the benefits that I am giving to my local investors, that means Indian investors should be a propose or should be same that I give to the UK investors. That means the conditions of investment given to me should not differ from the, in, the protections that you give to your homegrown investors. That is one of the standards. The other standard can be that, of course, if I am India and I've also entered into a bilateral investment treaty, let's say with France. Now I have meted France certain standard. Now the investment relationship or protection that I give UK should not ideally fall by practice should not fall below the standard given to given uh, under uh, the Indo, Indo French BIT. So basically, it has to be fair. The investment terms that I give UK has to be fair in it has to be equal to the local in to the treatment I give local investors in my country or if I have a set a standard with another country. Is it clear now? Okay, fantastic. Okay, great. So how to call a country as a developed country or a developing country? Like what is the determining factor? Why don't you tell me this? Who is this? Okay, I checked on Google, but I'm unable to find it. Like, what is the? To, if this is this is just common sense, and this is basic economics. Would somebody want to take this? I don't think there. If I may, if yeah. no one, I don't think there is any uh, conceptualization of develop any 
uh, specific uh, definition that you would get of it. I I, I see some negative okay, okay. answers, particularly from Goebbels, uh, about capital rich countries being developed. But the general idea is BITs don't make any distinction as to which one is the BITs or even multilateral treaties as to which is the developing country, which is a developed country. But it's just a matter of fact. Some countries are more developed. on various parameters as abhinav jain has shared whereas some uh, are in need of investments from uh, richer nations so as to develop their own uh, industries and i think that makes the determination correct so like i pointed out that there is no written demarcation of developed countries and developing countries it is merely a trend that you see you will hardly see investment from asian or african countries into european countries it is just a trend but what prachi pointed out the normal metrics are gdp per capita income simple uh, growth factors uh, cash intensity uh, how cash rich they are so on and so forth okay. somebody had a question regarding fed standard please uh, if you would go ahead yes sir uh, hello sir i am saurav karmakar I'm a fourth-year law student at Lloyd Law College, and I represent ICRPC. That is my venture. Okay. So my question uh, regarding FED, that's a uh, the definition of investment and investor. It is very much important for the for seeking the investment protection under any BIT that I can understand. So sir, yeah. what like what is the main definition, the investment or the investor, which definition influence? the fed standard because the my my reasoning my understanding is that the definition of investment if it qualifies and the if the definition of investor does not cover then the protection can be denied by the state so like what can be the uh, the perfect uh, like parameter or like what are the requirements That sort of, uh, sort of. If I, if I understand your question, you are trying to say that uh, my my explanation was based, of course, on the point that the investment un- qualifies under the definition of investor in investment under the BIT. Okay, so once so once it has qualified under those definitions, that is only when I am trying to come. The fact that it did not, the fact that, okay, okay, guys. if i am a investor and i claim that fair and equitable treatment has not been meted out against me what defense does the invest investi state have against that argument of mine so there is a dob clause sir denial of benefit no, clause no no, no 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 that's fine that's fine i'm not getting getting into that what you, my, my my the the answer to my question is in the response you gave right now So the first question you asked, that's your answer. So the definition and uh, the definition so is the if exact. If I am a if I am a investi state and you are an investor and you have claimed that fair and equitable standard of protection, fair and equal equitable standard of protection has not been meted out against me. So I, no, sir. Uh, I, sorry, but this is not the question. The question is which definition influences the most to seek the protection. because uh, like in every case in each and every case of investment dispute there are uh, like in some of the cases the jurisdiction part in the jurisdiction part the definition of investor and investment must need to be qualified and yeah, yeah, definitely sort of, sort of we are we are studying the we are studying the fair and equitable standard based on the point that based on the point that both investment and investor has qualified under the definition of investment and investor in the bit otherwise there is no point studying protection right then we'll get into the argument that whether first they qualified under the investment or investor and that is what i'm saying that is an argument from the country on which the investment has happened they can give that as an argument that no you can't claim fair and equitable treatment because your investment does not fall under the definition neither under investment or you are you are not invested as per classified by the bit bit treaty between both the countries that okay. can be an argument from from india side for example in this example that i am giving you 
But so, today we'll be proceeding with the pre predisposition that both the both the definitions like investor and investee, both of both of them have been qualified. But to answer you in short, what matters most is that in the definition of investment is the most disputed. Because to qualify under the definition of investor, okay, people are not really. Uh, people are not uh, people when when they are investing. They of course see to that I am qualified. And the definitions of an investor is not very broad. Okay, it's very it's very simple. I mean, it's normally very lucid, and you have to fall under three or four brackets. But the definition of investor has tricks and tricks incorporated in it. Okay, so we are moving on with the disposition that both these fall under the definition of investment and in this, uh, investor. Our discussion is today just based on fair and equitable treatment. Okay, moving on. Fair and equitable treatment, like we discussed. Okay, uh, uh, like we discussed that uh, it it emanates from an idea between a bilateral investment treaty. Now, the first instance of fair and equitable treatment was found in uh, the Havana Charter. Okay, in Article Twenty Nine of the Havana Charter, which said that. There will be non-derogatory treatment. Okay, it did not really say fair and equitable treatment. If I'm not wrong, it said that there will be non-discriminatory or non-derogatory treatment of each each party. Okay. So based on that, we see the development or enhancement of fair and equitable treatment across uh, time and ages. Okay, so for example, the first uh, era in which you know fair and equitable treat uh, treatment uh, clauses became a thing was in 1960s 1970s and now by the end of 2009 across about 2700 bits have been concluded across the world between various countries and these standards are extremely well protected and well drafted and well kept nowadays okay now now do you think it's fair that i give a tribunal so much power that they determine whether there actually has been fair and equitable treatment without drawing any reliance to international law or to national law no that is the debate that began the the survival tendencies of fair and equitable treatment that okay fine i have a dispute country a is investing in country a country investor from country a is investing in country b and now what happens is that there is a dispute country a the investor claims uh, fair and equitable treatment was not meted out okay they go to a tribunal that is one of the arguments now should we give such inherent powers to a tribunal to basically to assert in whether there has been fair and equitable treatment at all whether without getting into the ages of international law without getting into the ages of domestic law so on and so forth well it has been critically decided and critically discussed all throughout uh, all throughout the academia and investment treaty arbitration and they have said that a lot of people have held on to the opinion that giving them unchartered freedom to determine what constitutes fair and equitable treatment is incorrect so going forward they have set standards okay and those standards have emanated from various case laws now what are these case laws which determined that these are the benchmark standards for determining what is fair and equitable treatment but but before we go on okay it is very important to understand the concept of fair and equitable treatment okay because otherwise my discussions going forth will be redundant so what i mean by basics is that you understand the countries the relationship between the countries the investor investee relationship who is claiming the defense of fair and equitable treatment and so on and so forth so if i can get just a show of word like yes or no on the chat groups and then i can just proceed Uh, yeah, fantastic. So, 
Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Now, the first instance, which was considered to be a benchmark of uh, fair and equitable treatment was, of course, the definition of fair and equitable treatment in the US Argentina BIT. Okay. Uh, if I'm not wrong, it was article two, uh, clause sub clause 14, if I'm not wrong, I'll have to check that up. Okay. That was the basic standard for determining what was the fair and equitable treatment. Okay. Just getting into a discussion, I will be opening a copy of a Redfern and Hunter by me to quote the portions of the judgments for us to understand what are the standards in a better manner. Uh, now, the first standard which was accorded to was in the case of Santa Elena versus the Republic of Costa Rica. Okay. Now, it said in not so many words, but it said that Fair and equitable treatment is nothing but the investee state, the investee state giving the investor state a habitable environment to grow in. That's number one. And number two. is giving the investor a predictability on the investment. Now the second part predictability on investment is very important. Do we understand what predictability on investment is? Can anybody explain to me what predictable? So if I am UK and I'm investing in India, so what the, this tribunal is saying is that that India should give habitable conditions to the investor in UK and which also should accord a predictability in their investment. So what is predictability of the investment? Can, can somebody unmute themselves and answer if they have a, if they have a fixed uh, like just sir, I have an answer. Uh, yeah, your name? Yeah, Saurabh Karmada, sir. Yeah, sorry. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, the predictability of uh, from the side of the contracting uh, state might be in the stability of in legal framework. Uh, this can be the uh, element that I can understand. Stability in the uh, domestic legal framework. The first one, right? Okay. If I'm right, okay. then I'm I'll go with the other essential. Sir. You are. You are you are partially definitely correct. Yeah. Oh, so the uh, stability of uh, legal framework with uh, this commitment let me explain that this point. first let me explain. Sort of explain this point. A lot of people might not understand what is stability in the legal framework. Okay. So what Saurav is trying to say is that stability in the legal framework. What do we understand by stability in the legal framework? What we understand by stability in the legal framework is that today, if I'm an investor from UK investing in India under the let's say pre uh, uh, pre gst regime okay i have agreed to the liabilities under the pre gst regime while entering this investment the government has given me no idea whatsoever that the tax regime in india will completely change. Now that is and that changes the idea of how I invested in the country. That is what Saurav is trying to say. Saurav, move to the next one. What do you want to say? Yes, sir. Uh, the first one, the stability of legal framework and as we are discussing FET for a uh, fair and equitable treatment, it is also be assured by the contracting parties that the domestic market cannot be treated unequally by the contracting state. The domestic investment, the domestic investors should not be uh, treated uh, like much uh, than, sorry. 
that we've already discussed that is how we yes, understand uh, yeah. so uh, i think uh, that uh, that already uh, that is the uh, like my understanding that comes under the predictability of, from a government or from a contracting state to the investors and yeah, yeah. and dpit uh, the department uh, for promotion of investment uh, play a major role to present this predictability in front of the investor and uh, for the investment for seeking investment in their countries that is my answer sir thank you you are correct you are correct you are correct uh, you are correct and uh, so if anybody has any questions in relation to what uh, sorov said i will be open to take questions is it like the, uh, the variables should be assessed when it comes to taking it to a different country okay uh fair enough okay uh guys we are running a bit short of time and uh, so we'll we'll try to expedite it i i i really want to make it as interactive as possible uh people look from rj annual who's attended my class on investment treaty arbitration it went on for some time i mean like i said in the beginning i can't do justice to this in such a short frame of time okay but having understood what fair and equitable treatment is and having uh, running short of time what i sonali is it variable that we need uh, it is it the variables that we that need to be assessed when it goes to a different country okay uh, yes yes so there are two tests sonali to understand what constitutes fair and equitable treatment okay okay uh, this is this is what uh, normal jurisprudence would allow the tribunal should be looking at should be looking at one uh, international standards uh, which has been set okay what constitutes that international standard of fair and equitable treatment and which is the benchmark of fet standards like i said the us argentina bit was considered to be the benchmark for analyzing what fair and equitable treatment emanates if i can just read out that portion to you uh, what the tribunal said in okay so this was further uh, this was further upheld in the decision of lg and lg and e of lg and e versus the argentine republic okay and the portion of the uh, the portion which the tribunal said uh, which i want to read out it basically clearly demonstrates and determines what is basically a fair and equitable uh, treatment okay guys so uh, the investors fair expectations have the following characteristics they are based on the conditions offered by the host state at the time of the investment they may not be established unilaterally by one country they must exist and be enforceable by law in the event of infringement of the standard by the host state a duty to compensate emanates from the host state but not at the time of a necessity i have discussed four points here can somebody just narrow it down for me or i will repeat again yes enforceable by law sonali correct and what are the two basic things that i said in the in, in, yes sonali so the first two and the most important ones are the most important tests guys are that that the fair and equitable stand treatment is based on the treatment or the promises that was made to me during the time of investment 
that's number one correct now number two is they must be enforceable by law like sonali has said okay except in the time of necessity okay now i'll just shortly come to this point of what is necessity necessity is by various case laws has been construed as necessity as economic economic emergency in the country uh famines forced majority uh, occur occurrences and so on and so forth so can somebody tell me i'll take the questions let me just finish my uh, sentence okay uh, let me just finish what i'm trying to say here i'll take up the questions because we are running short of time and we need to complete so the, if everybody has understood the basics of fair and equitable treatment okay i mean again i'm saying that we can't do justice to the whole concept of fair and equitable treatment it normally takes 2 3 hours to get into the whole picture of what fair fair and equitable treatment is i have tried to give you the basic idea behind what is fair and equitable treatment what are the tests uh, what is the what is the landmark opinions uh, in terms of determining what are the various standards now what are the expectations that one should have but now we come to the point of necessity in the times of covid 19 in these present circumstances when countries are invoking force majeure clauses left right and center do you think fair and equitable treatment will hold up as an argument if i sonali can you please tell us uh, why do you think it's no hello yes yeah um i just think that it would depend on like facts and circumstances of that situation and when there are too many variables that cannot be assessed beforehand uh, i think it won't hold up as a fair, a fair argument at that point of time and in this case it wouldn't it's not something that you can perceive in the near future or distant future correct so uh, the the standard for fair and equitable uh, standard in terms of prevailing circumstances was held in the case law of lge uh, uh, there is another the spanish investment case uh, i'll tell you the name of the investor just give me a second this is lge versus argentine republic yeah 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 uh, i'll tell you the name of uh, okay yeah so uh, the mdt uh, the mdt chile versus the republic of chile is also one of those instances where uh, the one of those instances uh, i know we are short of time but one more instance that i want to point out is that uh, one of the important factors why fet is subsequently claim against india is because what con- hi tarik how are you i am good anubhav I'm taking some extra time sorry no problem no just for time so what constitute basically arbitrariness arbitrariness in government functions okay non transparency in functioning of government is also considered to be an argument against fair and equitable treatment so this is also a very very important standards and this is seen across case laws this is seen across case laws that a non transparency or non participation or non adherence to uh contractual liabilities by the government of the investi state is an argument against fair and equitable treatment so just coming to a conclusion and in continuation to what sonali said in ta- in times of covid 19 can we can we invoke fair and equitable treatment against investi uh, investi 
the broad answer is is no because the whole concept of necessity broadly refers to the point of force majeure events which constitutes act of god epidemic uh all of that so on the work force majeure clauses based on your so all these investment uh, if you so guys i would really want you to uh, i mean go through uh, this website called investmentpolicy.uncetad.org it has all the investment treaties entered between all countries what 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 it has been replaced by so on and so forth okay. so if you look at those investment treaties you will see the force majeure clauses are extremely exhaustively drafted extremely exhaustively drafted now the implications are uh the name of the website is investment policy uncetad. u investment policy. uncetad. org okay okay great uh um i mean considering that tarik is also here we'll just take take like four questions and then four to five questions and then we'll move into the next session um if i may see yeah, so uh, i think this was a question that was raised earlier which was uh, will doctrine of frustration defeat fair and equitable treatment and i realize that uh, raising that in uh, uh, an investment claim is a little hard because all mo a lot of the investment uh, treaties already do incorporate force majeure clause uh, frustration would only need to be brought in uh, if you don't have a applicable force majeure clause but uh, do you suppose there would be any bearing of the doctrine of frustration thing as it is primarily a common law principle upon investment arbitration i i just did not get the last bit of it so seeing as doctrine of frustration is a uh, majorly a common law principle correct uh, uh, do you suppose that there could be an applicability of the doctrine of frustration as well uh, in investment i so as to defend uh, a claims against fair and equitable treatment mm, see normally normally if you now this is where we stop interpreting investment treaties as theory and we delve into practicality investment treaties are long term treaties okay investment disputes are long term disputes cash intensive disputes okay keeping that in mind keeping that in mind what you need to understand keeping that in mind what we need to understand is that this you have to move on the predisposition that both the parties to this dispute moves forward on the point that they want to complete or they want the agreement to survive frustration more often than not defeats the purpose of the contract okay so if there is nothing hostile if there is no hostility and in these extenuating circumstances when the situation is definitely dire definitely uh, not worthwhile to even dispute fair and equitable treatment uh, of course will take into consideration but you will also understand if you look at if you look at the graph if you look at the graph in each of the investment treaties in the uncetad website they they when they summarize the treaties they also give you the demarcation whether they they have any interpretation to international law or reference to any national law so that also demarcates whether frustra frustration will supersede the uh, protections or the protection will supersede frustration on based on what they have adopted in the treaty per se so i have a query sort of yes so uh, um, as uh, as of now uh, when we see the lockdowns all over the country where commercial establishments can't be fulfilled then i 
uh, like it uh, i need you uh, like uh, you highlight on that point that if we could incorporate covid 19 clause in the dispute resolution clause uh, uh, it means that so many scholars recently they emphasize on covid 19 dispute resolution clause the concept of covid 19 dispute resolution clause is in such lockdown where 21 days for 30 days where one month there is no commercial activity uh, uh, on behalf of the part of investor or on behalf of the um, uh, fulfillment from the contracting states so do you really think that there should be some of the legal framework on the dispute resolution clause in the bits or any other contracts i mean it's a very specific question sort of now the thing is that i mean force majeure is already there uh, and force majeure normally in these agreements are extremely exhaustive uh, it covers epidemics pandemics uh, act of god um, uh, nat- national emergencies uh, in certain bits it also considers a uh, climate change emergencies and so on and so forth so everything is broadly covered why do we and it is an understood principle of law that during force majeure uh, force ma- force majeure uh, occurrences and if you look at the government of india notification the government of india notification which has been put out recently clearly tells us that what should be the norm uh, in terms of force majeure in terms of foreign investment and normally i, I mean uh, yeah in commercial contracts you can maybe add an addendum or get into an amendment agreement and uh, add a covid-19 dispute resolution clause but normally all i mean i don't know if tarik would have a different answer tarik if you're listening to this like no no i am listening to the expert so i don't think i have an expert opinion no, on this i mean like i'm just talking about force majeure yeah? like force majeure is normally covers everything uh, uh so yeah yeah i think in line between frustration and force majeure because a lot of times people confuse mm-hmm. so ideally they should know when to invoke force majeure and what are the contractual provisions pertaining to force majeure because uh, if it's a notice is required then you have to send that notice and force majeure i mean if you read the recent judgments of supreme court i'll tell you one judgment of justice bhakru by delhi high court uh, which is respect in respect to section 56 so it says that if there were terms of the contract which uh, talked about specific events I, i'll share that judgment with you no not that i am speaking on that but it is the judgment which is the law on the point and it is uh, something which explains force majeure very nicely i after the uh, the session i will definitely if anybody wants it i can share that judgment because if i start explaining it will take too much time uh i mean uh... Aditya Aditya is interning Aditya Mathur is interning with me and he has prepared a fantastic note on uh, force majeure uh, so if Aditya you would want to share something on that i think Aditya is a part of this session uh hi so uh, i feel uh, what anubhav sir is saying is absolutely correct because i am not sure if an addendum might be required to the original uh, bit if you have a force majeure clause that essentially covers what you want it to cover so i'm not sure if an addendum is the best way forward because having a clause like that in the first place essentially caters to what the exigencies of this particular pandemic require if i may add to that to what aditya stated and what uh, anubhav sir has been stating i think this is where the other dispute resolution mechanisms of uh, the bit come into place primarily in cases of uh, correct, uh, correct. covid 19 you have uh, clauses with respect to negotiation with respect to amicable settlement you if there's even a developing field for international uh, for investment mediation so i suppose uh, rather than looking at arbitration as a solution and looking at principles there under i think focus should also be diverted towards other adr mechanisms which can uh, solve the uh, issue without actually getting into the legalities of the uh issue mohit hi akash here a small uh, doubt on your question how are you i am well how are you i'm good uh, the point here is like more of it we are looking for force major from the point of uh, whether uh, the obligations where do we stand on obligation rather than a dispute this is just question on obligations if i am not able to fulfill my obligation under a treaty 
what are the recourses i have see dispute resolution will come at a situation where the obligations are disputed or there is a payment which is disputed or any obligation which can be disputed here i am not able to perform the obligation right so i think i think what you were trying to say was on a situation where the obligations or the rights are disputed hmm. but on the other way what i what i think anubhav and aditya were saying is in the event they are not able to fulfill their obligation they will kind of invoke this clause and also you know like what practically i have seen is basically even though there's no existence of the word epidemics they are still going on with uh, invoking this clause from the point of view of act of god or natural calamity so national emergency per se national because the definitions are so broad lockdown is per se a national emergency such or implementation of form 44 is a national emergency so as to say so based on these points the broad definitions and sort of one very important point that you pointed out and that needs to be that need to be addressed is that bilateral investment treaties are very big in nature okay like uh, uh they go under strenuous uh, negotiations they go under detailed discussions okay uh, the investment amounts uh, exceed billions of dollars at times okay so keeping that in mind uh, the the dispute resolution clause is drafted okay the d- dispute resolution clause is drafted uh, based on understanding of other clauses protection so on and so forth the force majeure which is drafted is absolutely concrete i have never seen a dispute amendment to a, a an amendment to a uh, fit or replacement of a bit based on a dispute resolution clause the commercial terms might change protection terms might change and that's why uh, the they terminate the bits and enter into a fresh one but i have never seen and and a whole bit being like you know cut off just because of a dispute resolution clause or implementing something as a covid dispute resolution clause because what is the idea behind the covid dis- dispute resolution clause are you saying yes, that sir. are you uh, so are the you saying, idea yeah please go ahead so uh, sorry sir uh, so the idea is to set a standard because uh, like if a dispute if i am uh, an investor or if i am an investment and my case is going on in a court of justice but for now the lockdown hinders the administration of justice this is also an obligation and now if on so this can be one of the one of the example the other examples can can be said and the dispute behind the idea for covid-19 dispute resolution clause is exclusively to set the standard that the investment or the investor or the like or the contracting parties or any party can not hinder the administration of justice later later on when the commercial activities or the investment activities will start so this is the idea behind uh, saying covid-19 uh, i get your point but i don't think it's still uh, very useful in investment arbitration uh, in commercial arbitration international and domestic both i can understand its implementation yeah so uh, we can we can if there are no further questions uh, and tarik has been waiting for a long time uh, i think we can begin with the next session just yeah. i think there is one uh, question which uh, fares uh, had asked which i suppose is uh, a little important which is uh, what is the scope for bit arbitration practice in india and uh, uh, we have anubhav sir we also have akash parihar who is a partner with anubhav sir at oh yeah uh, akash is my colleague guys uh, so uh, i would love uh, to have your views as to what is the scope for investment arbitration practice in india okay i i'm going to be uh, if anybody senior is listening to me here i'm going to be as respectful as possible uh and uh, uh, we're going to answer uh, the practice of investment treaty arbitration in india is still developing uh it's it's india has what we see is that uh there will be a huge huge surge in investment treaty practice uh primarily because uh, india has suspended and terminated all its uh, 
bilateral investment treaty we do have a model investment treaty uh, but the ratification stage of it is not good so based on that it's a huge uh, huge huge field that one can enter into it's if you like international law investment treaty arbitration is the only way you can make money uh, 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 in india there are a few firms which practice it uh, normally um, very few firms there are two in the south there are four five up north normally you get categorized as either a lawyer from the side of a lawyer from the side of an investor or from the state uh, or from, like, you know the investee that means state or the investor and that is how you get empanel in european countries uh, the concept of investment treaty practice is quite liberal that means there are four to five if firms from each side in disputes senior attaches and senior law firms so on and so forth but uh, that concept is still pre is is slowly gathering momentum in india um, uh, basically uh, the concept we normally hire foreign counsels to argue uh, for the state of uh, republic of india as well uh, uh, i am still pretty young uh, um, and uh, by the time i look at the fag end of my practice i would want to see that indian investment treaty practice booming and uh, uh, you know an indian uh, lawyers predominantly arguing substantial issues for india and other countries and other investors uh, hari salve does it right now but but in india it's pretty much an open field so far right and i think with that what we'll do is we'll probably close the uh, discussion in respect of the investment arbitration in respect of investment arbitration and the protection of fair and equitable treatment uh, we thank anubhav sir for that uh, uh, session uh, if you have further questions uh, we will be putting out the link to anubhav sir's linkedin and uh, you can probably hit him up over there you can uh, route us uh, route any questions that you have uh, through us and we'll forward the same and get back to you with the answers and the updates